Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study together Genesis chapter 6 through 11 along with Moses chapter 8. And we start off with the central figure in this, I guess this discussion today, and it's Noah. Noah, his name means rest and comfort. And maybe that's why in Moses chapter 8 verse 9 it starts off by saying, and he called his name Noah, saying, this son shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. And Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, notes how good of a man he was. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. An individual, a prophet, who is doing things that, well, walking with God, that's got to be pretty good. President Wolf Woodruff at this, the prophet Joseph Smith taught that Father Adam was the first man on the earth to whom God gave the keys of the everlasting priesthood. He held the keys of the presidency and was the first man who did hold them. Noah stood next to him, he being the father of all living in his day, as Adam was in his day. These two men were the first who received the priesthood in the eternal worlds before the worlds were formed. They were the first who received the everlasting priesthood, or presidency, on the earth. Father Adam stands at the head, so far as this world is concerned. Noah's in very good company, along with Adam. And, you know, you can look from the pictures, and, I don't know, maybe if you've looked at a, a movie production, it doesn't always portray the scriptures, but I think one thing they got right there was how the people were in Noah's day. Genesis 6 records that they were like this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Everything they thought about was on evil. That is pretty bad. And verse 11, The earth was also corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. And maybe it's just good way to kind of think, okay, what was it like back then? Well, I don't think we have to go very far to understand what it was like back then. Because President Ezra Taft Benson said, well, yeah, it was really bad then, and it's pretty bad now. President Ezra Benson said this, while our generation will be incomparable in wickedness to the days of Noah, when the Lord cleansed the earth by flood, there is a major difference this time. God has saved for the final inning some of his stronger and more most valiant children who will help bear off the kingdom triumphantly. You are the generation that must be prepared to meet your God. The final outcome is certain. The forces of righteousness will finally win, but what remains to be seen is where each of us will personally, now and in the future, will stand in this battle. How tall will we stand? Noah had three assignments. First, He's got to go on a mission. And for you got to go on a mission for 120 years. He was simply called, well, verse 19, the Lord ordained Noah after his order, own order, and commanded him that he should go forth and declare his gospel unto the children of men, even as it was given unto Enoch. I just think, that's a lot of pressure. Enoch is this missionary that gets everybody so converted to the Lord that the whole city is taken up and translated. Noah, you've got a mission now, 120 years, do it like Enoch. I'd be thinking, I'm not that good. Well, he has two other things he's supposed to do. He gets to make an ark, and he gets to get the animals in the ark. And so, Noah starts to do all three. And you can kind of, I like, I like this picture. You get two of the three in here, right? And it came to pass, Noah called upon the children of men, they should repent but they hearken not unto his words. There's a little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of mockery in some of those words in Moses 8, because they say, hey, we are too, we're also the sons of God. You're called the son of God. You got your, your family, but we're the sons of God. And they kind of seem like it's a justification. We are entitled now to do whatever we want because we have this title. We can do as we please. We can eat, drink, be merry and not worry about things. And violence is everywhere. The book of Jasher. 
It's an apocryphal work. Describe some of the violence this way. They taught one another their evil practices, and they continued sinning against the Lord, and every man made unto himself a god. And they robbed and plundered every man his neighbor, as well as his relative. And they corrupted the earth. And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. Uh, Noah continues preaching. As in Moses 8, verse 23, it came to pass that Noah continued preaching unto his people, saying, Hearken. You gotta listen. You gotta pay attention. Give heed to my words. And here's the little list you need to do as you listen and obey what I'm telling you to do. Pay attention. Simply believe. Turn back to God. Repent. Be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. And Here's the result when you have that, that ye may have all things manifest. And if you do this, if you do not this, the floods will come into you. Nevertheless, they hearken not. And I thought, well, that's very applicable today. If we'll listen and give heed to a prophet, I mean, pay attention, take that covenant on us, listen to the Holy Ghost, we'll have things made manifest to us by revelation. If you don't do this today, the floods of wickedness may have the potential to drown us. Well, they start to build an ark. And you get a, a term in there that you probably know, but going to go over anyway. It's a cubit. A cubit is from the elbow to the pinky. Normally that's 18 inches. There have been some times where it's as much as 21. So if you are the architect, one of the things you had to have, the characteristics you had to have via the architect is you had to have the right measurements. There's also a span. You can see this in the little picture. A span is between the pinky and the thumb. So it's going to be about nine inches. And the Lord says, okay, here's going to be the ark based on this. Well, you compare the ark to the other ships. How big is it? Well, you got a couple of ships listed here. You have the ocean liner. That's about 1,000 feet long. You have the icebreakers, about 450 feet. The man of war, that old wooden boat, 250 feet. Greek times, uh, 110 feet. Actually, it doesn't say times, it's trimmy. I think that's the way you say it, but I don't know. The Noah's Ark was about the same size as an icebreaker, 450 feet. Um, as Moses gets the timing done, where the ark's done. I love just the note that sometimes we have them out, uh, Noah out there trying to find all these animals. That's not the way the Lord did it. They, the animals, went in unto Noah, into the ark. Two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. I love that God says, you do your part. About, how, how about finding all these lions and things? I'll do my part. I'll just have them come in. And, the, or, and these animals are obedient. And soon they're packed up. Sometimes in a classroom, I'm asked, if Heavenly Father loves his children, why was everyone but Noah's family destroyed? Why is God allowing these people, or maybe even making these people, be killed? I love the way John Taylor answered the questions. By taking away their earthly existence, he prevented them from entailing, or giving as an inheritance, their sins upon their posterity, and denigrating them or making them wicked, and also preventing them from committing further acts of wickedness. It's an act of mercy. You won't be sinning anymore. You're not going to be passing this on to future generations. In a way, it's helping not only them, but also future generations. And God sees our lives in an eternal perspective. Well, and now, this is maybe a side note, uh, the gospel according to Gary Larson, or far side, okay, were all the animals on the ark? Well, here's a far side comic. You can kind of see the giraffe, the zebra, hyena, Noah, maybe some bears, and it looks like there's a couple of uh, legs up. And it, the caption reads, well, so much for the unicorns, but from now on, all carnivores will be confined to sea deck. Okay, I thought it was cute. So is this one. Two dinosaurs on a little hill, the ark floating away. Oh, crap. 
Was that today? All right, just had to do that. But I just thought, with that imagery of the ark going away, if you'd been in the position of one of those people who were not in the ark, what might you have thought and felt as a flood rider waters rose? Maybe there would be regret that you didn't listen to the words of a prophet, that you didn't follow through on those little nudgings of the Spirit. And, very similarly, if you had been in the position of one of those who were in the ark, what might you have thought and felt as the waters rose? Maybe once again, how grateful you were that you listened to a modern prophet, that you followed through what the Spirit was telling you to do. Even though everyone else was mocking you, saying, ah, that's dumb. You kept the faith and stayed in the covenant path. And I thought, you know, there's there's modern day arcs today. You could ask family, what could be like an arc today? Something that helps us in our destination to the promised land. Well, hopefully, we'll say our homes. Our homes are like an ark. We try and keep the evil on the outside. And it's helping us as a family go to our promised land. Definitely our church. The church is a vehicle to get us to be with our Heavenly Father again. And definitely a modern day ark being in a temple today. President Thomas S. Monson said, Noah and the un had the unwavering faith to follow God's commandments. May we ever do likewise. May we remember that the wisdom of God oftentimes appears as foolishness to men. But the last, greatest lesson we can learn in mortality is that when God speaks and we obey, we will always be right. Sometimes it's good, as you're teaching in a family or you know, in a classroom, just to stop and just say, let's ponder. And maybe you, you ponder on the phones or in a little scripture journal, however it is, but you just think, okay, you're, most likely you're going to be teaching people who are in an ark. They've been in the temple. They're at church. Maybe have them just reflect on when have you been blessed or protected by being in your modern day ark? Or when have you been protected or blessed by obeying the modern day prophet, obeying the Lord's words? They might have some wonderful things of how they relate to an ark and being in the ark, being in the church and the protection it provides against the floodwaters of evil in our day. I love this little poem. I didn't get the author, because that's author unknown. You can see that down below. All the water in the world, however hard it tried, could never sink the smallest ship unless it got inside. All the evil in the world, the blackest kind of sin, can never hurt you the least bit unless you let it in. So that idea, a ship will never sink if it does not let water inside. And in that way, the ark becomes a symbol to us. The word ark literally means box or chest. It's container, taba. And to keep that chest or box waterproof, it is covered with a pitch. In Hebrew, they would use the word kafar. For the rest of the Old Testament, it's going to be parallel, synonymous with atonement literally means to be covered with blood. Now being covering a box or chest with blood it doesn't make it waterproof, but the symbolism, the author Moses of this wants you to understand. This is a symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 7 verse 1, in general, just broadly, the ark takes a righteous family from a sinful world to a new world. Or the symbolism is the ark or Christ takes a righteous family from a sinful world into a new promised land. And just getting a little bit deeper, because I love this symbolism. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, the ark comes to rest on the 17th day of the seventh month. Exodus chapter 12, now we're skipping ahead. The calendar kind of gets reset at that time, because now we have a new event that's going to mark the beginning of the years. So the 14th day of the seventh month becomes the beginning of the Jewish calendar. First day. That's the Passover. 
Christ wants you to focus on this Passover, the sacrifice that he's going to be making in the future. So you get the Christ day, Christ eats the Passover with his disciples once again on the 14th day of the seventh month on the old calendar. Well, three days later, the 17th day of the seventh month, Christ, or the ark, raises from the dead to bring life to a new world. It is the kafar, the blood of Christ, that raises us and guides us and allows us to be in a new world with the promise of hope. Now, it's been a long time since I've done true or false, so let's do true or false for just a minute. We're going to cover a lot of ground, and that's when you're teaching. You cover a lot of grounds of little true or false or matching kind of things, so got lots to cover today, so this is how we're going to cover it. Noah took seven of some animals on the ark. True or false? Yeah, it's true. Two, Noah was 60 years old when the flood came. That's pretty old. No, he's actually a lot older. He's about 600. Okay, so that's false. Rain was the only source of water that flooded the earth. Not a chance. False. Talks about the foundations of the deep, waters of the deep being broken up and coming up. So water coming up from, from below. The rain did not cease for 40 days. That's true. Eight people were saved in the ark. That's true. And Peter wants to make, make a note of that, that it was only eight. You know, there's some people what's kind of like, okay, in addition to Noah, this is number six, in addition to Noah's family and animals in the ark, one of other family also survived the flood by staying on top of a mountain, and that's definitely false. The waters were 15 cubits upward, did the waters prevail, above the highest water. Now, that 15 cubits is 22 feet. Okay, and the Bible says that eventually this ark uh, rests on Mount Arat. Now, the traditional site is in northeast eastern Turkey. Okay, it's kind of like the border of Russia. President John Taylor just made this summary statement, and many prophets have, that this is symbolic. This is a baptism of the earth. Earth is a living thing, which will become a celestial sphere. John Taylor said, during the flood, the earth was immersed. It was a period of baptism. And Joseph Fielding Smith added, we read that it was in the 17th day of the seventh month, the great deep was broken up, and the rain for, was 40 days. The ark landed at Arat, and the 17th day of the seventh month, therefore, there were five full months to travel when the Lord drove the ark to its final destiny. Without any question, a considerable distance separated the path where the ark commenced, the journey, and where it landed. There can be no question to contradict the fact that during the flood, great changes were made on the face of the earth. The land surface was in the process of division into continents. The rivers mentioned in Genesis were rivers that existed in the Garden of Eden long before the land was divided into continents and islands. Well, you probably know the story Moses, or sorry, Moses, Noah. Uh, it's like, okay, it's maybe it's time, let's see what's going on. The first uh, fowl he sends out is a raven. A raven's a bird of prey. It's going to be going here and there. It's, it's going to be living off of carrion that may be left over from the flood. Then he sends out the dove. Doves are not going to be landing on anything dead. Only things that are alive comes back. Sent out seven days later. Comes back. I love the symbolism. Symbolism of there is an olive branch or peace. And he understands that there is going to be peace. And God says, I'm going to make sure and show you and you understand the peace because I'm going to give a, make a covenant with you. And there's going to be a sign of that covenant, a rainbow. Genesis 9. <clears throat> and I will establish my covenant with you, Noah. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. I'm not going to do this again. Neither shall they bear be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a token of the covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set a bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Now, I also note there's several Joseph Smith translations in Genesis 9 that you'll want to be paying attention to. Before I get a couple of those, just on the topic of a bow. The bow is a symbol of this covenant, but it's also going to be a sign of the second coming. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, the Lord had set the bow in the cloud for a sign that while it shall be seen, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, shall not fail. But when it shall disappear, woe to that generation, for behold, the end cometh quickly. He also said, I have asked the Lord concerning his coming, and while asking the Lord, he gave a sign and said, In the days of Noah, set a bow in the heavens, 
as a sign and token that in any year the bow should be seen, the Lord would not come. But there should be seed time and harvest during that year. But whenever you see the bow withdrawn, it shall be a token that there shall be a famine, pestilence, and great distress among the nations, and that the coming of the Messiah is not far distant. A couple of those verses from the Joseph Smith translation I was referring to are in Genesis, Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 9, verses 21 to 24. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant, which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come upon the earth, the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is my cov everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth, and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is mine everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will establish my covenant unto thee, which I have made between me and thee, for every living creature of all flesh that shall be upon the earth. Maybe that's why whenever we see rainbows, we're attracted to them. I think we're attracted to covenants with God. It binds us to Him. And those rainbows, just every time we see them in the clouds, just kind of makes us want to look over to them and maybe have that spirit just remind us. God's there. He does make covenants with us. We're a part of that covenant. And we're blessed because of it. Now, at the end of uh, chapter 9, there is a small little story. I'm going to spend just a minute on it, which is just kind of weird. Mo uh, Noah gets some grapes, gets a vineyard, makes them into wine. It's alcoholic. He gets drunk, and he seems to be kind of passed out. And then you have two of the sons that are like going in backwards so no one sees Noah's nakedness and kind of cover him. And you got one, he's not even there. He seems to be mocking a little bit. But then when uh, Noah wakes up, he curses the son that was maybe mocking him, even though he's not really there. He counts a bit puzzling because Noah awakes and curses Canaan, the son of Ham, who does not even seem to be present. There are indications this story has deeper meaning than is evident here, meaning which had to do with a temple garment. So I add this quote by Hugh Nibley. Quote, Nimrod claimed his kingship on the ground of victory over the enemies. See in Genesis 10, 8 through 10. And his priesthood, however, he claimed by virtue of possessing, quote, the garment of Adam. The Talmud assures us that it was by virtue of owning this garment that Nimrod was able to cl claim power to rule over the whole earth, and that he sat in his tower while men came and worshipped him. The apocryphal writers, Jewish and Christian, have a good deal to say about this garment. And he gives a lot of examples of what they say, and then he summarizes, quote, Incidentally, the story of the stolen garment, as told by the rabbis, including the great Eleazar, calls for an entirely different rendering of the strange story in Genesis 9 from the version in our King James Bible. They seem to think that the Arath of Genesis 9.22 did not mean nakedness at all, but should be given its primary root meaning of skin covering. Read thus. We are to understand that Ham took the garment of his father while he was sleeping and showed it to his brethren, Shem and Japheth, who took a cop pattern or copy of it, a sama, or else a woven garment like it, simla, which they put upon their own shoulders, returning the skin garment to their father upon waking. Noah recognized the priesthood of his two sons, but cursed the son who tried to rob him of his garment. Just as an incidental, uh, add that from, from Hugh Nibley. Genesis chapter 10 is like this genealogy. It's often called the list of nations, a table of nations. And if you can kind of see this on the screen, you can kind of see, hey, Noah has his sons and then grandsons, and they're in red, and great-grandsons in blue, and then great-great-grandsons in black, and then you got green. And it's a table, but it also, uh, I just make two, no two notes before I go on. One of those is mentioned in particular, Nimrod, that he was a mighty hunter, or a hunter before the Lord. There are other sources that seem to indicate that he was not a righteous individual. The Jerusalem 
Targum says Nimrod was mighty in hunting or in prey and in sin before God, and he was a hunter of the children of men in their languages. And he said unto them, Depart from the religion of Shem, and cleave in the institutes of Nimrod. The Targum of Johanna ben Uzal says, From the foundation of the world none was ever found like Nimrod, powerful in hunting and in rebelliousness against the Lord. Also, uh, Peleg, down there at the bottom left-hand corner, in his days, the earth was divided. The continents were divided. became kind of like they were today. Up until this time, it was one big um, continent. Table of Nations also indicates here's where they settle. And you can see that those descendants of Noah spread out and settle all throughout the, the Middle East. Yeah, I'm going up into Europe and in Africa. And I think that's one of the purposes, just kind of show you, hey, here's these genealogies. Here's kind of where they, they spread out. Genesis 11 concludes our study today where the whole earth has one language and of one speech. That started in the days of Adam and Eve. In the beginning, God gave Adam a language that was pure, perfect, undefiled. This Adamic language, now unknown, was far superior to any tongue which was presently known. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, the first language spoken by mortals was either the celestial tongue of God or such adaptation of it that was necessary to meet the limitations of mortality. And Adam and his posterity had power to speak, read, and write it. And sometimes you think, when are we going to speak that again? That'd be kind of cool. Bruce R. McConkie noted, During the millennium, it appears that men again will have power to speak and write the Adamic language. Of that day, the Lord says, He will turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the, of the Lord to serve him with one consent. That'd be kind of fun. Well, back to the Tower of Babel. Babe means gate, El is God, or the gate to God. That's what they're trying to do, is, well, I don't know, I think Led Zeppelin would say buy a stairway to heaven, but they're trying to build a stairway, a tower, a gate to God, not by righteousness, but by their ingenuity. Just so you know, this is um, Google Maps, kind of zooming down on the traditional location of this, the Tower of Babel. It is about 90 kilometers or 56 miles south of Baghdad, Iraq. And verse 6 of chapter 11, the Lord said of these people, Behold, the people is one. And I pause right there. Every time I teach this, one of my students in the class who's in high school or junior high, they'll say, that English isn't right. It says the people is, should be, people are one. The people's one. But I love, yes, people is plural, but I love that the verb is is, trying to denote the unity. They is one. And they have one language. And this they begin to do. Now that, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence and upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. And I thought about that in the opposite way. What if we, as disciples of Christ, is one? Wouldn't this be a fun verse to say about us in our day? You know, the book of... Uh, Nelson, chapter 3, verse 5. And the people became one. And they had one language. We spoke about the gospel of Jesus Christ in, in doctrinal terms that were correct, in compassionate terms. And this day, they, the disciples of Christ, began to do. And I just do what God wants us to do. Follow the Spirit. And now nothing will be restrained from them. Think of all the things we'd do if we were united in following the Lord which they have imagined, our imaginations, our thoughts. How can I do better? How can I serve? How can I be a better disciple of Jesus Christ? I think that's just a fun way of play on words for that verse. Well, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, confounding the, the language, oh, following the confounding of the language of the people, only the Jaredites retained a tongue patterned after Adam. And, you know, you get that first chapter of Ether, that's when that whole, there that same time, you get the Jaredites moving out and praying that their, their language would not be confounded for them 
as a family and then their friends as well. Then they can go to get a promised land. Well, thanks for spending a little time. Just some teaching thoughts. I think as I'm teaching this, a thought would be is just having that discussion on modern day arcs, modern day prophets. How are they helping to prepare us for the flood of world, worldliness, the flood of wickedness that's around us? How are what they're teaching keeping us afloat in what may be a very dirty society? I don't know if that came out right, but society with a lot of wickedness in it. There's a lot of good in it too, okay? Two, when have you been blessed or protected by being in your modern day ark as well as obeying the prophets of the Lord? How they can see themselves in the ark. They can see themselves in the old ship Zion. They see themselves as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that ark is taking us to the promised land. Stay in the ship. There's safety by staying in the ark. Just as the pitch or kafar enables the ark to be watertight, how has the enabling power of the atonement of Jesus Christ protected you? That could be a great discussion on how Christ protects that or the church doesn't mean that the storm isn't beating on it, doesn't mean the winds and the rain isn't there and that the waves are coming and that we're feeling the effects of that. But how the atonement of Jesus Christ, how the enabling aspect of Jesus Christ is protecting us in our ark today. And then just that little thought there at the end I had is if we are one and we imagine to do righteousness, what will be given to us from God? Just kind of a good thought for me to think about. Hey, well, thank you so much for spending some time with me today as we've studied a large part, the life of Noah, all the way down to the Tower of Babel. I hope you have a lovely day. Keep smiling. Bye.